basically today I'm going to talk about uh, the journey that I've been through in the last years, basically, when, that I started doing my PhD. And it basically mixes up two different words. One is the word of the adversarial machine learning, and the, the other one is malware detection. And today I'll try to show you how basically you can bridge the gap between uh, mathematical stuff and programs. So first of all, uh, like just like uh, the, the usual close up about why this is relevant. Um, we have machine learning, we have security, and now we, we make, we mix them. And basically what a lot of companies, do, uh, companies, uh, research labs and other entities out there, they basically train machine learning models on malware. And the, the, the problem they're trying to solve is detecting old and new threats. Okay. So imagine you, you, you create your nice deep learning model, and then you put it inside um, your, your appliance. And then you start, you start filtering out programs in the wild and your customers are all happy about it, right? Point is, well, that is not the entirely the truth, okay? The problem is machine learning is vulnerable to adversarial attacks, but that is basically has been done only for images, right? And let's try to understand how we can go I mean, can, we can go out from the image domain and go into these more complex of domains of the programs. First of all, how much advers a adversarial example works? Basically, you have an image, which is a token, like 97% of that is a token. And I think that everybody in the room and in the virtual room thinks that that, that picture is depicting a token. Then what you do, you, you add some adversarial noise that for us, it might be also just, I don't know, gray pixels. And the result is, well, you have an image, which is still looking the same, but to the eyes of the detector, that is now is a cat. That's why, I mean, the, the rationale is kind of simple because by adding some noise, I'm forcing the network to focus on spurious correlations that relate to the cat class instead of a token class. Well, that's nice, right? I would like to do the same with malware detectors. So these the, these your intelligent antivirus programs. I take a malware, which is for sure a malware sample, and I add some adversarial noise to produce this variant of the sample that is adversarial, right? Well, the problem is you cannot do that because a program is a complex file, and later on I'm going to discuss more about this, but just adding pixels or adding values, it's not working. So that is the first problem you, you face when you want to bridge adversarial machine learning attacks in the malware domain. The fact that you cannot just add things to a program, you need to sweat a bit more. Second problem is, okay, let's say that we are able to manipulate files and we are able to produce adversarial examples for malware. What we can do is, um, well, now we have a piece of program or a malware that is injected with some noise, but what is making me sure that the, it's still working? And what makes me sure that the, the variant is still doing the same things as the original program, okay? So what usually, I mean, some work in the literature do is, well, I take a sandbox, which is a virtual environment. I put them, I detonate the malware inside the sandbox. So the malware basically runs in a fake operating system. And I say, yes, it's still working if the functionality is the same as the first one. Of course, this is costly, right? Because you have a sandbox that is, must be initialized every time. And since these attacks are, I mean, they work in iterations, you have to reset up the whole sandbox at each iteration of your attack. So this is kind of costly and resource demanding. And the second, last, last problem is that there are many solutions out there. Like, oh, we, be, we do adversarial examples for malware in this way. But there is not so much open source code out there. There are some attacks, but again, they are not so reproducible. And there is not a general framework like for images, which is, okay, I have to take the image, I have to add, and that's it. So there is some sort of plot hole inside the story, okay? So to bridge this gap, um, so the gap are, we don't, have, we don't have a way for creating these samples and everything is costly in terms of resources and there is no reproducibility. So what we do, uh, we kind of go in the opposite way. So we create what we call functionality preserving attacks, 
that are non-trivial manipulations of the file format that we use to inject content that will fool detectors in the future. As the, you know, the summation of pixels to the image, we use these functionality preserving manipulation to include the injection that we would like uh, to use to bypass detection. And since these attacks are functionality preserving by design, we basically throw out of the window all of the sandbox techniques that we would like to use because these attacks already preserve the semantics, which is nice. And lastly, we basically create a framework called the Ramen, um, which is a general framework for creating attacks. And I'm gonna you know, share some details about it, how it is built, and how you can use it to craft your attack, a new attack, okay? And cherry, I mean, uh, cherry on the cake, uh, there, is, there are tools that I'm maintaining uh, to create this kind of attacks, which is Sacrament Malware and Toucan Strike, which are two tools that you can use to foster your research in this domain by just instantiating attacks in Python and launch them. So let's deep dive a bit more into this three concept that I introduced you. First of all, what is this formalization, Ramen, which is regularized adversarial malware examples? Uh, to be honest, the name, I, I mean, I find the name nice and then i created the acronym as i think everybody doing science but um jokes aside the ramen formalization is made up of two main components the manipulations which are again the, these objects that i use to include things inside them the program and the, how you optimize the parameters so two things so these manipulations are working in the input space. It means that you don't have to pre-process your malware before. You have, um, I mean, you're working in the end-to-end. -end. So you take the malware, the bytes of each program, and then you perturb it. The goal of the evasion is described by this loss function L, which takes an input instead of X, like clean X, which is the input, takes H, which is the function that applies the manipulations, Z, Z, sorry, which is the input program, and some parameters T that basically mimics the input, the gray pixels that I'm adding to the image. These are the uh, parameters of the manipulation. And then we have a penalty on the manipulation itself. That means if I add too much, well, maybe, I mean, if I want like a stealthy attack, I just want this attack to add two bytes, then I have to tune this penalty um, parameter and that's why it's regularized in these uh, and that's the regularized keyword in the name so these are the two, so manipulations first component how we optimize these uh, loss function second component so let's start by the manipulations so what are these practical manipulations uh, these are manipulations that preserve the functionality so you don't you you throw out of the window all of the sandbox and they are parametric with this T parameter. What is T? It means that given a manipulation that I'm, I'm gonna detail later, um, and giving T, I'm basically saying, hey, modify this sample in this way, describe it by H with parameters T. So inject, I don't know, this content inside my sample. These are cumulative in the sense that you can stack them together. So I can apply H once, twice, three times, four times, because they are all, functionality preserving. So it's no matter how many times you stack them on. So if we think about intuitive examples in the image domain, think as H as the rotation and T as the degrees, okay? So now I'm, I'm tilting the, this image by 90 degrees and that is still a token, right? So the functionality is preserved and, but the content now is different. So to bridge this gap into programs, we first need to describe how programs are stored in memory. So in Windows, so a spoiler from now on, I'm just only talk about Windows malware detection and static Windows malware detection. So we have a machine learning model that is gonna recognize a malware just from the structure. And now I'm gonna present you this structure. So our every, I mean, every executable in Windows is done in this way. So you have, all of these here, some adders, so the, this DOS adder, which is basically kept for retro compatibility, and it's useless, um, not, no kidding. So if for every person that has a Windows machine in the room, be aware that there are, I don't know, chunks of 200 bytes are completely useless. And these 
few hundred bytes are stored in each executable of your machine. Just saying. And if you run one of these programs inside a DOS machine, it's gonna say, hey, this is not a DOS program, and then halt its ex execution. Then we have the real few adders, which are the PE adder and the optional adder, which are basically, they really describe how the program must be loaded in memory by the operating systems. And finally, we have the juice of the program, which are, I mean, the code, the initialized data, and other relevant information stored as sections. So each section contains some content, and the content might be, again, the code of your executable. So as you can see, we cannot just, you know, flip one byte here and just hope that the malware detector is going to be bypassed. Because if I flip a byte here, well, the executable is, is corrupted and it, it, it not runs anymore, okay? So I need to understand which are the gaps that I can use inside this complex structure to include new content. So let's start from the, from the top. Um, Remember when I told you that there is like a useless uh, portion in the executable? Well, that is exactly one of the places that an attacker would like to use to store some content, adversarial content, okay? In this case, this partial or full DOS manipulations means I use all of the blue area, just be careful about some locations, but I'm not gonna match into the detail. Uh, I can basically rewrite almost all of this blue area with the content that I want, and if the detector is using those bytes as features, well, I have bad news for them. So this is like the first manipulation. Second is, well, you know, you have something useless, you can make it even more useless or more useful for the attacker by extending it. So there is a field in this blue area that points to the other header, so to the PE header. So if I just manipulate the, that offset, and I just say to the operating system, hey, look, the PE adder is just 100 bytes later on. Well, the operating system is gonna say yes. And then I can basically create more space between the real adder and the useless adder to store more adversarial manipulation. Then what I can do, well, in a similar way, the PE adder and the optional adder as an offset to the sections, so the code, okay? So again, hey, operating system, this offset can be, you know, shifted by 100 bytes. Who? Cool. I'll do it. So again, as an attacker, you saved an other space that you can use to store information there. And that is, again, because the, the format is allowing you to do that because it's very, very ambiguous. Another thing you can do is, well, I could add, I'll add another section, like, Another fake code section, which is not ever going to be executed, is you can also ask the operating system to either um, load it in RAM or not load it in RAM. You can, I mean, you can do basically whatever you want. And this gives you another chunk of bytes that the attacker can use to, you know, inject content. Lastly, forget about everything that I said before. You just say, well, you know, this is very complex. I don't like this. You can just pad the, by, the, the file. So you take the file and just add things at the bottom. That's it. And this, all of these are functionality preserving because they're exploiting ambiguities of the file format, okay? So we don't have the plus anymore. So forget about X plus some noise. Now we have these. So the H, all of, basically these are H functions, right? So we have the partial DOS, which is a, like one implementation of H. And we have extend, which is money, I mean, another H, and so on and so forth. So now we have a way to include content, but what we include? Well, we have this parameterization, right? So one of the things is let's use the padding manipulation, for instance, which is the easiest one, just adding by the end. And let's say that P is this vector. Basically, the padding manipulation takes th those values, which are byte values and just append it to the end. So P is, is specifying to the manipulation what to add. Or also for the partial DOS, which is you know, the blue area that I showed you, if I use the same, it's gonna I mean, re overwrite the first, let's say five bytes in that blue area. So that's how the T parameter works. It basically specifies 
which are the bytes that I'm going to inject inside the sample, and H is telling me where and how. Okay, good. I hope I convinced you that we have ways that are beyond the summation of noise to inject on program. Now, okay, since it's, uh, you know, it's an optim, I mean, um, creating adversarial example is an optimization approach because we have this loss function to minimize how we can optimize these T parameters because T is basically discrete because we have zero, one, two, three. I mean, it's not really clear how can I use like, I don't know, Adam optimizer or stochastic gradient descent. So how we optimize these parameters? Well, there are a lot of uh, ways you can do it. So let's start from the easiest one. Let's say that you don't have access to your detector or the detector that you want to attack is uh, like non-differentiable. So the only thing you can do to understand how everything is going is by computing, ends, I mean, sending sample to the detector, which may be like a RAMO detector, and retrieving its answers. So the score, the probabilities, okay? So, and that's how basically I optimize the T value, the values of the parameters T. So I send a malware to the, I mean, I send like an adversarial malware, and I, I wait the remote to classify it, and I retrieve the score. Now that I retrieve the score, I optimize each single byte values in the T vector, and I keep repeating, okay? So here you can use basically all of the black box optimization techniques that you like, genetic algorithm, cosine and leaning, whatever. Problem is, uh, you are not very willing to do that. I mean, in, in this context, you are basically optimizing one byte at a time. Let me just open one light because here everything is dark, okay. Um, you're basically optimizing one byte at a time. It means that if you're injecting 10 bytes, who cares, right? But if you're injecting, let's say one kilobyte, it means that your black box optimizer has one kilobyte of variables to, you know, uh, to interchange. And that is a huge effort and a huge waste of time because the number of queries just explodes. Instead of pinging the remote, I don't know, 10, 20, 100 times to really reach convergence, you're gonna need like, you know, 1 million of queries. That is not doable. And the, the other problem is that by flipping bytes, by, I mean, with almost random values, you're basically searching in a huge space blindly, but also maybe the relevant strings are much less. Like, let, let's think about uh, all of the possible strings that I can write with 100 character and all of the possible strings that has sense in 100 character, you know? This is the number that makes sense. Those are the number that doesn't make sense, okay? So what I can do to speed up? Well, uh, this is part of some work that we also published, which is Gamma, which is a genetic adversarial machine learning malware attack. Uh, instead of optimizing one byte at a time, basically you said, wait, what if, we extract content that we know it's related to the class we want to reach. So the good work class, right? Regular programs. So what we do is instead of optimizing one byte at a time, we can, I mean, we, we eat <laughs> some part of good work and we inject them inside the malware. So instead of optimizing one byte, we optimize the chunk. So let's say I extract some from Photoshop, some from Firefox, some from Paint, and counting, and then the T parameter is telling me how much of this content I have to inject. So instead of having gazillion parameters, let's say I use the section injection attack with T, with this T, and it means that it has to extract the 0.2% of the first goodware, the 0.7% of the second goodware, and the 0 0.5, sorry, 20, 70, 30% of these three good work, okay? So now the content that I'm injecting is much more because I'm not just adding one byte at a time, but I'm adding, I don't know, 100, 200 bytes at a time, depending on the T parameter. And the number, I mean, the dimensionality of the problem now is drastically reduced because now it's only three against one kilobyte. So by doing this, we create malware with chunks of good work content extracted here, here and there, and 
that you know might mislead the detector. So how can you implement this attack in Raman? Well, first of all, you define the loss, which in this case is the score of the remote classifier and a penalty on the size. Remember that lambda c of, so this is just because we don't want to inject everything, but we would like to, you know, try to minimize also the quantity that we inject inside the, the, the program. Then we have to define a manipulation, let's say padding or section injection, and then we define an optimizer. So in the case of gamma, it's a genetic algorithm, but then in this case, you can do what you can use whatever you want. But then by changing all of these three, you have all the attacks you want. So let's say you create an, another manipulation called X, and then you came up with a new loss function called L, and then you have an optimizer of your choice, and you just have to, you know, to <laughs> like Lego bricks, you just have to mount them together, and then you have an attack. And that is the power of the methodology, okay? Because then you're free to go, and everything is fixed, and you just have to try it on. So there are some, so this is like a partial table of like some works that you can recast into ramen. Uh, if you go on the paper, there are more, but basically that's what you do. So uh, each row is like an, an attack that has been uh, proposed and each column is like one of these, you know, three axes that they mentioned, the loss, the manipulation and the optimizer. And then by, um, you know, plugging here and there, the tool that you want, you have different strategies. Okay, great. But let's say that we are a fan of gradients, okay? We really would like to use gradients because, come on, gradients are nice to compute, they are interesting to use because they point us in the right direction, and other countless of reasons why you should use gradients, but we are in the malware domain. Okay, fair. Here is some piece of math, okay? So, to, you know, to update my t parameters, what I would like to use is gradient descent. So, the t parameters are just a gamma multiplied the gradient of the loss function that I showed you with respect to t, right? I mean, this is reasonable. Um, the problem is um, this is not doable. First of all, most of the model detectors are, I mean, use a feature extraction. It means that you completely destroy the input output relation. I mean, the input, oh God, wait. You have a, a function that is not either not invertible and not differentiable in the middle. So you have the model might be differentiable. You have the, the manipulation might be differentiable, but in the middle, you have the feature extraction. And that's how you basically completely lose the end-to-end -end differentiation. And then the second problem is that these H functions are not really differentiable. So I cannot use this. I cannot, I mean, differentiate end-to-end -end and produce the T parameters. But I really want to use gradients, you know? I mean, they are there. The model is differentiable. Why? There, is, there should be a way to use them. And the answer is, yes, there is. And it's basically a mixture of things. So first of all, you attack your classifier in the model space, in feature space, let's say. And you have gradients here, right? So you can do whatever you want. You can do iterative gradient descent there. And then you produce a sample X. What you can do now is, reconstruct it, so you have to compute another optimization problem where you reconstruct these samples in the input space. So you manipulate an input until its difference in feature space is very, very little with the point you computed before. So just to summarize, this is basically, you know, the implementation of hybrid gradient based attack. So you have Z or Z prime, you put it into the feature space and then you compute the gradient descent and you do what, whatever you want. You achieve evasion, or, or maybe not, depending on how mind, or if it converts or not, but in general, you compute a sample which is good for you, and then you have this step, which is the input space of construction, where you apply some manipulations until you find a way, I mean, until you find the one that is very, very close to yours. Of course, this is a huge mess, right? Because this is another optimization problem, which is basically a black box optimization problem. But that's the only thing you can do if you want to match two things in two words that basically doesn't have much in common. The good thing is that at least there, there is a one part of the, I mean, one part of this pipeline that use gradients and that is very, very fast. So it's basically you find a good point where you have to project your point. 
the, the, the input space point. So how can you implement hybrid gradients attack to environment? Again, so now we have one step more, which is the gradient descent algorithm and the reconstruction strategy. So the loss, again, you define a loss, you define the manipulation, but then you need like a, I don't know, feature space optimizer, which can be like a single gradient descent step. It can be a projected gradient descent with 100 iterations. And then you have to define a reconstruction strategy. In this case, um, you can, under some assumption, you can basically uh, manipulate one byte in the input space and then try to invert it back depending on the models you're using. But the point is, again, you have a way to categorize everything. So here there are a few attacks. Um, and here is basically, again, which loss they use, which practical manipulation they use, and which optimizers they leverage to either explore the space or recreate the sample in input space, okay? So this was basically overly complicated, but the, the take home message was, um, if we can use gradients, we have a way to still leverage their, you know, their, the fact that they are fast to use, but we still need to reconstruct something at the end. Or I don't care about everything about, I mean, I don't care about gradients, but I just use black box optimizer, which are slower and converge slower and you know, slower. Slower is the keyword of black box optimization to me. Okay, nice. But how can, I mean, this is overly complicated again, right? You have manipulations, you have optimizer. Well, yes, but I'm basically giving you everything already done with the second malware uh, library which is a Python tree open source library and contains all of the attacks that I show, I mean, all of the manipulation that I showed you. It has also like a command line tool for testing. Like, you know, for the ones of you uh, that used Metasploit, which is like a penetration testing tool, you basically type some command like target, your model, manipulation, DOS, run, and it runs the attack. And, it, and I was working on an integration with a Microsoft uh, tool, but, mm, I mean, then things got complicated and then they dropped the project entirely. But, you know, just it, that was life. So um, let's now deep dive for the last part of the, of the talk. Let's just deep dive in some results, okay? So we use SecML malware with all of the complicated things I just, you know, throw at you in the last half an hour. And I'll try to, uh, and I'll attack some detectors and in, in particular, two different kinds of detector. So the, this is basically the pipeline of a malware detector right now. So we have um, the input program as bytes. So each byte is a value from, z, from ranging from zero to 255th. I have some feature extraction fee, and then I have, I don't know, some feature vector. Then I have the model. The model classifies it according to a threshold, and ta-da, malware would work plus. So two ways here. I can use end-to-end -end neural networks. So an end-to-end -end neural networks in this case takes the, in, the raw bytes as input. So in this case, Malcolm is a, is, a deep, is a deep convolutional neural networks that takes in input one megabyte of, 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 the, of the file. So the first one megabyte. If it's more than one megabyte, it's cut. If it's less, it is padded with a special value. But then it has a lot of parameters, okay? Because you start with one megabyte in input and then you just, I mean, go to like one, uh, one output. Or I, and I mean, we have some, you know, um, other networks as well, but the, the, the idea is that we have end-to-end -end neural networks on bytes. These has also has some feature extraction because um, bytes do not have any meaning in a mathematical space. What does it mean to, the, the, to sum one to the character A? or to divide the character B by 10. Does it make sense, okay? So this network uses like an embedding, an embedding layer that basically, that is learned at training time, that basically creates a space where byte has some metrics and some distance. So the A character, now it's distant X from the number one and distant Y from the character L, okay? Where in the input space, this doesn't make sense. So here we have basically 
some networks, so Malcolm, DNN, Lin, and Relu, which are like a smaller network, again, from the paper. I'm not going to deep dive more into the architecture for, for today. They are just deep convolutional neural networks. And we have some also something like Smerbot still working, which is like a gradient boosting decision tree trained on features from the PE file. In this case, we take, so we take one program and we basically extract the APIs or the sections or the entropy and other relevant information to produce instead of one megabyte of input, just few hundred, two thousand and three hundred eighty few K features. Sorry, I'm just I'm mixing numbers today, which is a very, very compact representation, and then you just do machine learning on it. But this is not differentiable. So on the left, we have differentiable models. On the right, we have black box, I mean um, non-differentiable models. So we're gonna use the hybrid um, optimizer for the left. And, the, and, and, and then we're going to use the gradient-free optimizer on the right. First of all, uh, some rock curves, uh, just you know, to show you that these detectors are performing well. Um, basically, on this plot, uh, we have uh, the gradient boosting decision tree, which is the uh, brown line, which is basically going over the top. It means that it's performing very, very well on the data set that we tested. But while the other ones are all of the neural network, forget about the red and orange, which, uh, which are like smaller network trained on a proprietary data set that we cannot share. Uh, all of the others have been trained on a, with a public data set called Ember, which is uh, 16 millions of samples, which is, a, I mean, it's a lot. And uh, we were basically, we were afraid that with the proprietary data set, we had like a huge, um, in increment in performance, but that was not the, the that was not the case. Anyway, so this is basically the world we live now. We are living in. As you can see, the false positive. I mean, already with zero point one percent of positive rate, false positive rate, the true positive rate is very very high. So these networks are really discriminating between good and malware. But that what ha what happens when you apply adversarial attacks. So the first attack I'm going to show you is that you take all of that blue area and you manipulate it. And this is basically the, on the y-axis, you have the detection, the, oh gosh, you have the detection rate at 1% FPR, which was, you know, the red line here. And on the x-axis, you have the iterations of the algorithm. So as you can see, there are some of them which just drops at few iterations, while the others slowly decrease until they basically almost stabilize. So this is a very, very naive attack because this full DOS implementation is basically manipulating only 200 bytes in the header, which is not much. It's just the useless header that everybody has. And, and already, let's see, Malconv has a de detection rate that drops on 30%. It means that seven malware over 10 evade detection. Let's, let's, I mean, give more uh, power to the attacker. Now we use the extend manipulation. We take the, int, the useless header and it expand it by a bit. And that's basically, is, this is basically saying that these models are completely not robust. Because as you can see, all of the curse now goes under the 20% with, I don't know, 50 iterations, which are not much. And the content that is injected is, again, is two and in this case it's 200 kilobytes sorry it's 2k kilobytes my bad so sorry that's 2k bytes so two kilobytes sorry i'm messing up so with just this in injection these models are completely lost and the rationality behind it is that we are basically destroying all of the local patterns that they learned at training time so if you have the useless header, which is always the same, and now you have garbage, basically they are not, ab more ab they are not able anymore to understand what is what, because now there is garbage where they put a lot of attention. Last, we have like another attack as well. And uh, as you can see here, there is now the, this, you know, yellow, no yellow, sorry, purple line, which is flat on 80%. In, in you might say, wait, it's robust. I mean. It, the, the, the attack is not having any effect, right? 
the problem is we basically anal analyze this and in the region where we are injecting this content sheet manipulation, the classifier has zero gradients. So it's not that it's robust to this attack, it's that everything else that is not in the first part of the, of the program has zero gradient. It means that it's not even looked by the network when taking a decision. And you know, just to mention, in all of the other plots, this purple line is the lowest one. So it's not that this is strong. It's just that from at some point, Malcolm doesn't really care about the program anymore. It just look at the first bytes of the other. Okay, so I hope I convinced you that with this hybrid strategy, you can really start to pen test your machine learning model that has been trained on malware, okay? Now we forget about gradients and we go to the gradient free gamma. So we add content from the 75 goodware and we test them against the gradient boosting decision tree, which is just to remind you was the best one. And again, Malcolm as a baseline. And we regularize the amount of content that we inject by tuning Lambda. And that is the result. So on the Y axis, we have the detection rate of both detectors. On the X axis, we have the, uh, the content, the, sorry, the, the size of the content that we inject. And each dot is uh, one, I mean, is the value of, I mean, is the result of the attack. So detection rate, attack size, for a particular regularization value. So on the right, we have basically a lambda, which is almost zero because we are not penalizing the content. On the left, we have a higher value of lambda because we are deeply regularizing the content. And as you can see, even if the best model was basically scoring uh, on top of everybody, here, the detection rate also goes under 20% after uh, with some of the regularization parameter. And the attack size is now even less than the one that I have showed you before with the extend attack, right? Because here we have like 80, I mean, 80, uh, 800 kilobytes, no, sorry, it's much more. Um, today, I, I, I'm not able to compute the math, I'm sorry. So it's basically at this point here with uh, 100, sorry, five, 110 queries, we have a detection rate that is less than the 20%, which again, eight malware over 10 AV detection, which an attack size, which is just 600 kilobytes, 800 kilobytes, okay? And I mean, don't mind Malcolm, it's just, I mean, as you can see, every attack is basically flattening its uh, detection rate. So what if we take these results and we throw them at real detectors, like uh, commercial products. So we were thinking that maybe even if we use commercial product, I mean, that commercial product will be robust, right? Because I mean, they're selling it. I mean, they're selling them, they, would, they are testing them, right? So we take VirusTotal, which is a cloud service that hosts many different uh, antivirus programs. And we just take the executables that we created in the previous slide and we test their performance. And these are the results. So on the, we basically anonymize them because I, I don't want like a company shouting at me because I broke their model. <laughs> um, so let's, I anonymize everything. Each row is the performance of a particular antivirus against the real model set, which is the first column, the uh, uh, random padding attack, just, you know, to, to show the, the, some baseline and the section injection attack of the previous slide. And as you can see, there are some of them whose results are worse than a random attack. It means that the adversarial content is really making its way in bypassing the detector, even if we didn't really customize the attack on that detector. This is just a transfer evaluation. I created the sample for one detector and I test it on another one. So AV1, at a 93% of detection rate that is flatlined with 30% detection rate after the section injection attack. And to me, this is kind of uh, not frightening, but it makes me think what they're doing. I mean, this is just the injection of content that I, I don't know, added somehow. It's not rocket science. So that's kind of strange. 
And that's it. Uh, basically, I'll just close with like this very, very short video about how you can use Tukan Strike, which is basically the tool that I showed you, uh, that I told you. So you basically type the target that you want. You add the data. In this case, I'm using like a ransomware, which is called Pythia. And I just, I can, you know, do some prediction on it. And I can just create a white box attack against Malcolm by just typing it. And that is basically how you can weaponize these kind of things, but also how you can use these things to test your appliance. That is basically the take home message that I'm trying to achieve in this field, giving people a way to test their product before somebody like me goes into the wild and tests my adversarial malware against the detectors. Okay? And as you can see here, um, the pack is concluded and achieved and uh, successfully bypassing the detector. No, wait. Okay. So to conclude, I hope I convinced you that uh, this Raven uh, general framework can be handy in creating attacks in the security domain. And to work, it needs some practical manipulations, which are these manipulations that let you avoid use any sandbox and just preserve the functionality of malware. And then we have tools for do that because it's usable and somebody in the audience I know already used it and also like open a pull request on it and I'm very happy about it. But it means that, I mean, people are, people are using this, this tool and I'm receiving, you know, some feedback here and there and that's, I'm very happy about it. And lastly, detectors are weak to adversarial like samples, which now I call X samples because these are programs, Windows programs that bypass detection of malware, of malware antivirus programs. Limitation of this, and then I conclude, uh, how we can defend against this? Well, uh, you can strip some of the manipulation that I told you uh, today. And basically in the last three months, two papers came out, one for, with a certification technique that tries to bridge the gap, but Gamma was still able to break it. And uh, basically one month ago, and I basically saw it yesterday, on Usenix there is some you know, defense going on. But again, it must be tested a bit better than I saw it in the paper. And this was only on static attacks, so only on the structure. So for the future work, we can move to, let's say, inject some behavior inside this malware. Like now the malware before encrypting your disk and launching itself, it also, I don't know, prints something on the console, but just wait, you know? So I inject some behavior that is keep everything functional again, but it's gonna fool also like a detector that looks at the trace of execution. It would be nice also to create more attacks against other detectors that look at other formats. I don't know, Unix files, because this was only Windows and then you know, you can keep going. You can take more domains, you can take more threats, you can do whatever you want. And that's it. Thank you for the attention. I hope I, I don't know, that was interesting for you and it was not either boring or either, I don't know, more boring. So thank you for the time. I'm done, question time.